In this episode, we talk with an actress and founder of an arts academy changing young lives in the DMV. Signature Theater presents The Color Purple, and an a cappella group, DC's Finest, shares a legacy of harmony. This is Artico. Welcome to a new season of Artico, the show that highlights art and artists in the DMV. The weather is hot and so is the art, so let's get to it. Dancer, choreographer, actor, and writer, Sean Cosby is changing lives from youth to adulthood at Center Stage Academy for the Arts. Who is Sean Cosby? Sean Cosby will always be the little girl with the baggy leotard in the back row to a certain extent. I always have to keep that little girl in mind with whatever I'm doing. One, it keeps me humble, it keeps me grounded, and it allows me on those days that I don't feel like doing what I'm doing anymore, it reminds me of how far I've come and that somebody else is watching what I'm doing. And I have to get to my destination because someone else's destination depends on it. Young dancers or young performers that come through my doors now, they don't understand the greatness that's in them. And that's why you have to be very cautious about who's instructing you and who's teaching you because that person ultimately needs to pull out the greatness that we can't see in ourselves sometimes. I think my mom saw something in me because she put me in dance when I was seven. And I've told this story a million times, I was not very good. I didn't have the natural abilities that dancers have. I wasn't flexible. I mean, I had rhythm, but I mean, I wasn't like that standout superstar dancer that had all that personality and flexibility and you just kind of knew where they were going. That wasn't me. And I used to see these other dancers and from my view in the back row, the other dancers looked so big. They looked so large, they looked so beautiful. They looked like they had it all together. And I just remember peering into that center stage spot all the time and wanting to be there. I didn't know how I was gonna get there. I didn't know what it was gonna take, but I just wanted to be there. And so I set my mind on the fact that I needed to do whatever it took. And that was practice and practice and practice and practice and practice. And then one day it just clicked. And I really looked in the mirror and said, I look like a dancer today. Maybe I can do that. And I, my goal was just to be in the center of the group. And what ended up happening was I ended up choreographing for the group at age 15. So I surpassed the center and went to the front <laughs> in which I was instructing them. So that's kind of how the passion started. Also at the same time, I was acting. That was happening a lot for me. I got my first professional agent when I was 14 in New York City. And I had won a competition in New York and it was about 600, 700 contestants, and I won the dance category. And out of that, I got an agent and I got a manager, and they started calling me into New York for professional work. And I was working professionally on some TV pilots, some TV shows, different dance things. I did some things for MTV. Like, it was, it was a lot of that kind of thing going on at the same time that I was still choreographing. The first film that I did was written in 2007 and it was entitled Those We Don't Speak Of. It premiered in 2016 and um, it was a piece that basically I was sitting in my room one night and I just started writing down just ideas, just kind of like scenes. And I put them away for a while and came back to them and then the scene spun into more scenes and spun into more scenes and more scenes and more scenes. And then it, I looked up and I had this entire script. That was liberating. That was a sense of freedom that I had not felt in that way. And that's what made me really, really continuously fall in love with it. So, you know, I have another feature film coming out, 33rd in Memphis, very proud of that film. I'm proud of the DMV. I'm proud of the talent that we have in the DMV. And I think that one of the things that I'm purpose to do is to be a gatekeeper or, or a gateway for those people. I am proud of it for the fact that it showcases so many of the DMV's wonderfully talented people. 
actors and, and, and directors and cinematographers and crew members and wardrobe stylists and creative directors, location managers, producers, caterers, everyone that put their hands on this. It went beyond my expectations of what I thought that the movie was going to be. Aside from that, I think the story is really good. So Center Stage Academy for the Arts, the purpose and the vision. The vision was one that started in 1991 when I graduated from high school. My mother and I always wanted to do something in the arts with a building. You know, we wanted to have a building that housed talented and created creative people. That was always the goal. We didn't know who, what, when, where, and why. And as you can see from 1991 to 2018, it took some time to get there. My mom and I would come into contact with so many young kids that had no place to train. They had this talent, they had this gift, they had this, this vision, they, could, they, they had this drive, but they had no place to train. So we wanted to do something like that for young kids into adults, into adult adults, seasoned adults. Because there are a lot of adults that I come, come in contact with that are now saying, I'm leaving my job and I want to pursue the arts full time at 50 and, and 55 and 60 years old. And they said, you know, I did my time. I made my life what it was supposed to be, but now I want to pursue my passion. And it is nothing wrong with that. I always say you don't want to ever be something that's trending. You want to be something that sustains. And sustainability is what we're all about at Center Stage Academy for the Arts. Signature Theater is an iconic presence in the DMV, presenting the highest quality of theater performance for quite some time. Signature's newest offering is The Color Purple by Alice Walker. We sat down with the director and a few cast members to talk about the production. Um, well, even before Color Purple was an iconic piece in American theater and in film, it was an iconic novel, uh, telling the story of Celie, the main character, and her relationship and journey with God. The exciting challenge in bringing it to the stage is doing what I can with the production to retain that immediate connection between Celie and God, even though the piece is peopled with a lot more characters. And so that's m my approach to it, that everyone, many people know the book, I think most everyone is familiar with the film. And so because all of those images and influences exist in the audience already, I'm trying to get it to go back to its most basic essentials. So I really am doing everything I can to strip the production back so the characters are out front and in the lead. It's an honor for me to actually get to play Suge Avery. I actually call my mom Suge because of Suge Avery, because of Color Purple. I've watched the movie so many times, I've read the novel, and it just means so much to black culture and as well as to my family to be able to play this role in my hometown. Um, signature theater is like, I consider my home theater. Um, and I was so excited to, um, when we first talked, when they were first talking about doing this role, doing this show actually, and um, bringing it here because it is such a strong piece. And I think I know, so many people know about the movie, especially with it being Whoopi Goldberg's um, breakout role, mm -hmm. and then having, you know, Oprah Winfrey as Miss Sophia in the show. So, but the stage production is very different and not a lot of people got the opportunity to see one of the two or even both. So to put, to bring it here at home, so so many people like Danielle was saying, to bring it here for those who've never seen it could be a part of this journey. Certainly the biggest impression that I took from the novel is, is the immediacy and the potency with all of the story being communicated with Celie's conversation with God. And so the, the instant that you bring other human beings into it, I get concerned that it dilutes that connection. And so that's always the thing that I return to in all of the staging with the other people who are very much a, a part of the journey, that it is all how Celie remembers it. So what I've also um, done with this production is that it is a memory. 
that Seeley in this production chooses from a reflection place, from a hindsight place, takes herself through the journey of her life again, but it's not just a repeat, that she's at a level of self-acceptance and maturity that in going through it again, she's open to, if not looking for, things that she missed, lessons from God that at the time may have just seemed like pure abuse, and I'm not taking away from the impact of that, but that with this hindsight, she can actually appreciate the deeper lesson that gets her to the place she gets to by the end of the journey. And so with that, even though it's a memory play, the danger for uh, some uh, actors is that they then become merely a tool of Celie's uh, memory if she were just going through it the same way she's always gone through it. But because Seely in this production is actively open and seeking new lessons, it gives all of the other actors and characters agency. They can be fully themselves and not just a tool of Seely's memory. And it's what they bring to their journey that Seely has, oh, I see, aha, uh -huh, this, uh, this is new for me. And so even though it's a memory, it's still very much alive. I think that Suge was far beyond, you know, her years, you know, in, in this particular time, everyone saw her as promiscuous and over-sexualized her and, and sometimes not even as a human being, you know? And when I look at her now and I look at what the world is experiencing with pronouns and even just black people identifying what um, boundaries even within the workspace, within relationships, Suge was already doing that. Suge had already decided, I'm gonna do this, I'm not gonna ask for permission, or when I really care about someone, I'm not gonna be afraid to show that as she falls you know, in love with Celie in, in this beautiful story. And um, so it's just taught me to be true to who I am, um, and even what I just said before, to be okay not being okay. Celie has taught me um, strength, um, how it, feels to actually have to sit and stew in mm -hmm. mess, right? And how do you find yourself out of that without the hatred um, and without holding on to, you know, grudges? Um, because she went through so much. She, she went through so much with the loss of her children, being um, abused um, physically and emotionally, mentally, spiritually, all of those things, verbally, and um, still having to, you know, keep her head down and just do, always being told what to do and not having a choice. And she finds her voice. I, I'm loath to ever tell anybody what their experience should be. I am loath to influence what their experience should be. When I approach storytelling for the stage, I try to keep it porous enough that the audience can actually have a conversation with themselves and with the piece as it's unfolding. Like reading a novel. Read a novel, we cast it, we design the sets in our minds, like, but it just all comes organically. So even though the story is specific and, and deeply experienced by the actors on stage, we keep it porous enough so the audience can actually have that conversation. And so for me, you know, I, I don't have an expectation of what they should take away, but I hope that the conversation actually happens out loud after they've seen the performance. But those same strings, heartstrings, will be stirred and I guess my hope is that at least for the two and a half hours, people can feel themselves again in relationship to effective storytelling, in relationship to emotions of the moment, shared experience with the audience members around them. Because in the end, even in the before times, that was the most impactful part of the experience of coming to live theater. On that level, we will not disappoint. So if you're wondering, and you're willing to take the risk of COVID and we're required to be in masks in the audience, oh, please, come on down. You will not be disappointed. D.C. police officers are called upon to do so much for the citizens of the nation's capital. They protect and serve the community, but some also serenade us. Three decades ago, several officers discovered that they were bonded by more than their dedication to a noble profession. Their voices came together in perfect harmony. That's when DC's finest was born. 
And you better not try to we please my folks too much. Do, do, do I. And you must laugh. We at my jokes too much. We because people will say we're in love. Did you hear well, well, Ron and I were on the police department at the time, and uh, we had a we had a CDU detail. Uh, we were all on the bus, I think in the area of around 500 block of Pennsylvania Avenue, just sitting on the bus, you know, just waiting to be called out if we needed. Uh, so we just got the, you know, we got to kicking it with each other, you know, and, and, and music came up and singing came up. And we, we got to singing a few oldest but goodest together. Uh, me, Ron, uh, Jimmy Bethel, and a guy named Al, Al Johnson, and Dean Lockins. When, we, when I first went on the police department, and even thought about singing, the, uh, they had strict rules back then. Uh, they said that uh, uh, we couldn't sing in bars, couldn't sing where they sold liquor or anything like that. So they kind of like barred us from, from starting anything. So we was just out there for, you know, for a minute. Then they kind of rescinded those rules. Like Jimbo was saying, we were on a detail. And uh, we started singing on the bus and for guys who hadn't practiced or rehearsed or anything together, it sounded it, 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 like it had promise. You know, it sounded like it had promise, and we said, hey, let's get this, let's get it together. I thought we got together, and Mike and Mike, this was back in October 1985, and um, one of uh, the guys' uh, uh, officers, lieutenant down there, asked us to sing at her, her son's wedding. And that was the beginning of it. You know, that was the beginning of it, and you know, from there we just kind of like took off. Some of the most notable places, we sang at the Pentagon. Uh, we auditioned for General Colin Powell, and General Colin Powell sent us to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, to sing at the dedication of the Buffalo Soldier Monument. Uh, we've also sang for President Bill Clinton's wife for a couple of her birthdays for two few years in a row. Uh, we met and sang for one of the oldest Buffalo soldiers that was living at the time. He was like, what was he in, in his 90s at the time? Like he was, like he was 98, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sang for Rosa Parks. Yeah. I don't know how we got that gig, but uh, I mean, man, it, 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 it was such a special yeah. thing for me to, right. To sing with that for that historical woman, I mean, you know, we we, we got opportunity to, to meet her and, and and shake her hand and hug her, and I mean, it was just you know, it it, it done some special for my spirit, you know, to meet such a, a wonderful person, you know. I got I got a special story about that. Okay. Cecily Tyson was her uh, chaperone. That's right. Yes. And, she Ce and Cecily mm -hmm. uh, had to uh, get to the airport. And she had to get to a hotel first, then get down to a national. And so my car was parked right outside. And Cecily at the time didn't want to take pictures. She didn't take too many pictures with people. So I said, um, Miss Tyson, I can get you to your hotel and to the airport if you take a picture with, with us. So make a long story short, Avon Barber, who was with us at the time, mm -hmm. we jumped in the car, took her to her hotel, she got her things, she got out of the car, she hugged me, we took pictures, she squeezed me, she kissed me on the cheek, we took pictures. So, got her to the airport, <clears throat> and we was coming back from the airport, and Avon was like, mm, mm, mm. I said, what's, what's wrong, Avon? He said, uh, I ain't gonna tell you, man, uh, I ain't had no film in the camera. <laughs> 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 because I was going to ask you, well, what, I was gonna ask you well, why, is, why is it that we haven't seen those pictures? <laughs> he, said, he, said, he, said, he said, I, I ain't want to say nothing, man. I ain't going to have no film. I said, come on. I said, keep on. And then, and, then, and then when we got back, the group had took group photos with Miss Parks. Without you. Without us. Uh, and she had gone. Oh, wow. And we was like, oh, no. They serve in many different roles in production, 
Jason Smith, a local graphic artist, has worked on many animated series and gaming projects for companies all over the country. We talk shop with Jason regarding the craft and the business of the craft. Um, nine times out of ten, I'm called upon to do um, loose, relatively, relatively loose, uh, black and white tonal images that tell a story, creating beats um, within the story. Um, there are other aspects that are attached to that uh, in terms of environment and, uh, and props and characters. Um, being a visual development artist, you have to be able to do all of it. You have to be able to create characters, costumes, props. There's a lot of research behind it, which for me, just a footnote, is uh, the most gratifying part. I love researching things. I love learning, um, and I love applying it uh, to what I do. Uh, that is, in a sense, more gratifying than the actual painting. Uh, my family encouraged me, um, specifically my grandmother, who was a piano teacher. And more often than not, you know, I would spend a lot of time with her in the summer and around holidays. And she would have students over. And at that point, that would be kind of like my study time. I would go in the back and study old Disney picture books and things like that and create my own stories. Um, um, I was born in Huntington Beach, California. Um, when I was around six, we moved, it was just me and my mom. We moved up to Palo Alto because she, uh, started her graduate studies at Stanford um, as a as a research scientist. So a lot of my earlier uh, development was in California. And then when I was 12, we moved to upstate New York. We moved to Rochester. And uh, from there, uh, I moved all over the country. I lived everywhere. I'm one of one of one of the biggest projects that I worked on that I really enjoyed uh, was Scooby-Doo and Guess Who. And I was working with a guy uh, named Chris Bailey, who's uh, really well known, well known in the animation uh, industry, uh, primarily for uh, Kim Possible, which is really popular um, and almost iconic at, the, at this point. A large part of what I do um, is based in and around story and story moments and visualizing something that is not there on the page. Um, I come in very early in production to interpret things and they are then, uh, you know, kicked down a pipeline and, and worked on uh, by others. And John Navarez is probably the biggest influence. Um, he, he's responsible for so much in terms of what we see. Um, in the animation uh, industry right now. Um, he's behind so much. Specifically the characters that he worked on, like the grandmother, it was just, <laughs> it was just so special. Uh, so I am very grateful. He, he is the biggest influence. Um, coming up, uh, you know, it was more, it was more about fine art. Uh, I was really into Rodin, the sculptor. Um, for one reason or another. And I was introduced to him when I was very young. And then of course, um, on the campus of Stanford University, they have a Rodin garden. And when I was very young, I would take my bike uh, and go to the Rodin garden and sketch. And I would use that as my anatomical studies um, at a very early age. So I, st I still cite Rodin um, and, the, and uh, you know, specifically the Gates of Hell. There, there are others, but I think, yeah. strangely enough, uh, John Navarro's and Rodan. Those, those are probably my two, my two favorite. Um, if I had to choose between games and films, I would, I would rather uh, work on a film. With the film, it's different uh, because you're looking at acting and you're looking at emotion and you're looking at um, composition, uh, which is, for me, my biggest uh, asset. I, I'm, I'm really into composition. I've been told that it shows and I, you know, I continue to, to work to, to just get better and better at it. 
In, in terms of movies that I'm really into right now, I would say Onward and Coco. Um, Coco, uh, my friend worked on, and I don't mind bragging about it it's because he's amazing. John Onward um, just touches on a big part of my childhood, which was Dungeons and Dragons in the '80s, and you know, um, you know, I I was definitely, you know, one of the kids in Stranger Things. That was definitely, you know, my my background. Uh, so. Yeah, Onward and Coco. People talk about sacrificing for your art. Um, I don't believe it's as esoteric as all that. I think it's more about time and sacrificing your time. I don't necessarily want the message to be school is the end all be all, because it's not. Um, because this is, this is a different kind of vocation, you know? Um, Many people who are artists, you know, are also business people. So I know artists with business degrees. I know artists with math degrees. Um, I know chefs with math degrees. So I think, I think the takeaway is just developing some form of discipline um, and getting used to being critiqued um, because it's a big part of doing well um, in any business or job. So you, you definitely want to get a taste of what it's like early, and, and school can provide that for you. That's our show. Thanks for watching, and until next time, always remember to follow your art. Around collecting things. Oh, I'm going to get my room and my glove. Well, sweetheart, we they're suspecting things. We don't you know what? Done told you what people will say. I know what people will say. We're in love. We're in love. This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.